Forum Fukushima, which I was tempted to call something else. I'm not even going to repeat it now. It made Dan Galanti laugh. And he said, I know you're going to say that live. I said, maybe, maybe not. Somebody already heard a, a British um, descriptive and said, wow, did you really say that on the air? And I did, but I won't repeat that either. All right, you're saying, perhaps, who are these people? You just threw out a bunch of names. Let me tell you about our first guest, Arnie Gunderson. 40 years, 40 of nuclear power engineering experience. He uh, attended Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, where he earned his bachelor's degree cum laude while also becoming the recipient of a prestigious Atomic Energy Commission Fellowship for his master's degree in nuclear engineering. He holds a nuclear safety patent. He was a licensed reactor operator, is a former nuclear industry senior vice president, and during his nuclear power industry career, He's also managed and coordinated projects at 70, count them, seven zero power plants in the U.S. Arnie Gunderson, welcome to Coast to Coast AM. I'm so tired of people not talking about this, so we thought that we would get hold of you, and we are delighted that you're here. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. What, what, a, what a great cast of, uh, of people you've got tonight. Well, there are no lawyers between me and this microphone. Therefore, our management at this moment is in deep space but um there's nothing coming out of the mainstream media except for little things like the boxcar sized dock 70 foot long dock drifted thousands of miles across the pacific and ended up on an oregon beach and the environmentalists are saying say it's got little creatures from over there which could pose a threat to creatures over here 15 uh, bluefin tunas all were uh, found to have radioactive uh, cesium in them. Now, nobody said whether they were safe to eat or not, but I'm assuming that no cesium is good cesium in one's diet. So tell us where you are on all of this, and perhaps you can enlighten us as to why the entire mainstream media seems to be mum on this subject. Well, I absolutely agree with you that, that mainstream media is, is uh, mum on this topic. Um, the, um, the bluefin tuna is the, is, is the most frightening information in, in the recent month or so. Um, you know, that, that tuna was caught um, five months after the accident. So it was caught in August of last year. Mm. But the, the researchers didn't um, publish. The, they wanted to wait until the data was published before they, they, they warned us. But that tuna um, uh, spawned in, the, in Japan and then immediately started heading toward the, the, the U.S., um, so it didn't stay in that high radiation field very long, and still when it hit here, um, you're, you're right. It had um, both cesium 134 and 137 in it. That that means it's a Fukushima uh, signa, uh, signature, yes. and, um, um, and and no cesium is good cesium. Well, so that thing I did not know that until this moment. It was caught five months after the uh, March 11th accident. And, and we're it, just now hearing about it. Right, and it likely only uh, was in the Japanese waters for um, around a month uh, after the accident. And then the last four months was swimming across the ocean and growing. So, um, you know, had it been caught off of Japan, the concentration of cesium would be a lot higher because the, the, there's a lot less mass as it, as, it, as it swam across the ocean. It ate a little bit more as it came. Yeah, and one of them that they had tagged... I don't know how they did that or what was the motivation, but apparently it made uh, two round trips in 600 days. You know, these, uh, these tuna, they went 15 for 15. Every tuna they caught had cesium. This isn't just a single tuna. Um, they, they tested 15, and all 15 tested positive. Uh, so that basically means that, uh, you know, every, every tuna in the, in the Pacific now is, uh, is carrying cesium-134 and 137. What, what, I, I think that number is going to go up. I think that uh, the, the concentrations of cesium are going to grow up over the next couple of years. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is not a one-time occurrence, I don't believe. And no one has really established any, I mean, I don't know of them, uh, any uh, acceptable levels for radiation-contaminated or radioactively contaminated food because there's just no way to know it will, uh, it will affect different people differently, just there are supposed to be 14, they estimated 14, now again, this is a news release of some, from some time ago, but 14,000 extra deaths, uh, human beings, one year and younger, 
little kids. So some people will be able to withstand it, and others will not. And that, that's just kind of how it is when you're playing with nuclear radiation, isn't it? Yeah, there's this thing called linear non, uh, no threshold. And um, the, the more you get, the worse it is. But there is no number below which you're safe. And, um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's what this tuna is showing us. But uh, um, first off, it's going up. I'm, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that when somebody else steps forward now and publishes, we're going to see higher numbers than what, uh, what was already detected. And second, there is, no, uh, there is no de minimis number below which you're safe. Okay, so, hmm, well, now there's just been a, a piece of, you know, the people in Japan are like, don't turn those back on. We just as soon go back to sticks and stones as, as be wiped out, have the entire nation wiped out by by this accident. But uh, I understand there, the government is saying we're going to have to turn them back on because leaving them off is a society-threatening uh, issue. They are, um, they don't have... Uh, very many other energy sources, and they're and they're scrambling to get all the uh, what we used to call fossil fuel, all the uh, all the combustibles that they possibly can now. I mean, they are in pretty serious trouble. You know, you said it at the beginning of the hour. You know, they they put fifty four nuclear units in, um, in in likely the worst location in the world as far as you know earthquakes go, tsunamis go. Um, you know, I was in Japan. Um, I wrote a book in Japanese uh, um, and uh, on the book tour. And it, the plants are built right on the ocean, and right behind them, mountains just take right off. Uh, there's very little habitable land in Japan, and uh, so you've got high concentrations of people, high concentrations of earthquakes, and high concentrations of nuclear plants, and they just don't go together. So I can understand where uh, uh, the Japanese are, are really concerned about starting these things back up again. It's, a, it's interesting because it's being led by mothers, um, which uh, you know, women, uh, which traditionally in the Japanese culture is, uh, is this is a unique experience that women are stepping up and saying, you know, hell no, we won't glow. It's a, it's a, a real change politically. We were going to have. Um, Arnie, we were going to have a um, a nuclear engineering professor. He's in the University of California system. I must not say his name, nor which of the universities in California, because it's a pretty big system. But uh, whichever one it is, they study um, they study nuclear engineering. You can narrow it from there. And he was very reticent to um, at first. And then I thought, hmm, I don't think he's going to do it. So a friend of mine who made this introduction, he, he eventually said, well, first it was graduation, then oh, he was going to be traveling, and then it was like, nah, I think I'm going to have to bow out of this one. How much pressure do you, uh, do you think is on the professional community, whether it's in academia or whether it is in uh, the actual nuclear industry, to keep quiet? How many billions of dollars are at stake if the people decide, we, 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 we're not, we don't want this, turn it off? Yeah, you know, there, there's um, an enormous amount of money that's going into the educational uh, facilities like MIT. MIT has a, uh, a Tokyo Electric endowed chair on their nuclear faculty. You know, so there's just one example of, uh, of how per- pervasive uh, money is. I've been working with researchers who are having, who are doing great science. This is not crazy science. This is great science. And they're having an extraordinary difficult time getting their articles published, um, again, because of, uh, of industry pressure to, uh, uh, to downplay the significance of this event. Um, there's tr- trillions of dollars um, at stake, and uh, um, whether it's the United States Congress, which is putting enormous pressure on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, not to make these plants in the U.S. any safer, um, you know, in Japan, it's uh, it's similar. There's an enormous amount of pressure to get these plants started up before the, the safety modifications are uh, are put in place. Um, there's um, it's it's truly a a group of populists uh, versus an enormous amount of money, and uh, I think the jury's still out on who's going to win the struggle in the United States and in Japan. I mean, you know, Europe is uh, uh, the Germans have decided not to, the Italians have decided not to. 
Uh, there's like a domino effect going on in Europe where people are walking away from nuclear. In Japan and in the United States, uh, uh, there's an awful lot of money on the line, and I think it's going to be a long, uh, a long march. Now, the way a nuclear power plant works, I mean, do I have this sort of right? You, you <clears throat> control the heat of the reactor. You get yourself a water source, flow the water over the, the uh, rods, turn it into steam. Steam turns the turbines, which turn the generators or alternators, whatever they might be, and out goes the power. Is that pretty much it? Um, yeah, you know, the, but the heat, you know, when you hear the, a nuclear plant safely shuts down, um, that, what that means is the, the nuclear control rods fall into the nuclear reactor and stop the chain reaction. But about 5% of the heat never goes away. And uh, that's uh, the, the problem with this is that once a uranium atom splits, you only get 95% of the heat from the actual fission. But 5% hangs around in the heat that's generated from all these radioactive pieces. And how much so, heat is that, Arnie? Oh, it's enormous. Like, you know, 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, Fukushima was, uh, each of the Daiichi units were about 3 million horsepower. So 5% of that is 150,000 horsepower. You know, think about diesel, you know, diesel trucks. They're, they're maybe, um, you know, 500 horsepower, 1,000 horsepower when they're running flat out. So you've got hundreds of diesel trucks worth of heat that has to be gotten rid of. Um, and if you don't do that well, it really doesn't matter if the control rods have fallen in or not. Uh, you're going to have a meltdown. What are these control rods made of? Uh, they're made of boron. Uh, boron okay. is really good at absorbing neutrons. Uh, they, they, you know, they have a cladding on the outside, but really it's, it's nothing like but you know, 20 mule team borax. It's a, a boron and uh, it's a sponge for neutrons and prevents the chain reaction from going on. So, so it, so the the science has really not changed uh, since uh, Oppenheimer. I mean, this is still old school stuff. It's just the gear looks prettier. Yeah, yeah well, uh, and actually, most of the reactors uh, in the United States were built before 1980, and the same in in Japan. So, not only is it old technology, but they're old reactors. So the average reactor in the United States is 30 years old. That's, that's in Japan. Um, we're we're dealing with. Uh, equipment now that's uh, starting to show its age on top of a technology that really hasn't changed in the last 80 years. You know, uh, this uh, physicist that I mentioned earlier, who shall remain nameless because because we could get him in trouble, and I don't want to do that. He would be on the show, except he's, he's not like you or me, and uh, he's probably got a lot of pressure, but the, the spent fuel rods over there, spent means what? They become at what, what percentage of... Um, of um, radioactivity do they have to drop before they're considered spent because they're still hot? Yeah, actually, uh, a, a new fuel rod is, is um, almost is hardly radioactive. Um, and as they become spent, they become more radioactive because they pick up the, the, the uranium splits and uh, the, the pieces that it splits into are a lot more radioactive than the... the, the um, uranium from which it came. So a spent fuel rod uh, can have uh, just an astronomical amount of radiation. The, the amount of radiation in the fuel pool at Fukushima Unit 4 is, um, is roughly equal to all of the, um, the cesium that was exploded in all of the 700 above-ground nuclear tests that we did in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So um, you know, a spent fuel pool... Um, actually means it's, it's highly radioactive and, uh, and contains an enormous inventory of radioactive, uh, what we call radioactive daughter products. And so what do we do with our spent rods? <laughs> Boy, that's a great question. I, I think if, uh, if the United States could answer that question, they would uh, we'd be on a path to more nuclear power plants. The... Uh, there's an interesting uh, court case that uh, was just came out yesterday. Uh, we're an appellate court in, um, in um, New York City determined that, um, that we don't have a plan. Uh, basically, they threw the NRC's uh, uh, this, uh, policies back and said, you don't have a plan to store this nuclear fuel. Go back and do it over again. The, um, 
Um, right now, we're sticking it in these pools, and, and let's look at Fukushima Daiichi as an example. Um, there are seven stories in the air, and um, um, uh, and very heavy, so it's almost like putting a swimming pool on top of a hotel. You know, it's it, it not exactly the ideal place for a large mass like that. Um, so what happens is that the, the pool uh, contains an enormous amount of radioactivity, and we're keeping it up there because it's cheap. The best thing to do would be to put it into dry casks, which means you take it out of the water and you put it in these heavily shielded. They weigh about over 100 tons. Um, then you'd uh, set them on the ground where they're a lot less resistant to earthquakes and tsunamis. Fukushima had some dry casks, and they survived just fine. But it's all the fuel that's sitting in these fuel pools that, uh, you know, is, is a worldwide concern. Um, and actually, the plants in the United States are, are probably four or five times worse than that as far as the amount of uh, nuclear waste that's stored in their fuel pools. Well, I have a bunch of questions to uh, to ask you, and we're we're down to about I don't know maybe maybe a minute, but um, very very quickly because I don't want the thing to cut you off. What is reprocessing? Well, the plan is that reprocessing would would strip out the um, the plutonium that's generated, and that could be reburned in another generation of power plants. Okay, uh, gotcha. Has, yep. Go ahead. Well, I'll tell you what. I don't want you to have to, to give short answers, so just to make sure everybody stays awake tonight, because this is a little bit of a classroom, we're, when they start throwing the terms at us, reprocessing, and blah, 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 at least we'll know what they're talking about, because I don't think they do. This is the one, that's just me, I don't think they do. This is the one and only Coast to Coast AM. We shall continue with our Fukushima Forum for this Saturday night. I'm not happy that these fish are contaminated. And the cold streets we roam that uh, are in the lyric there, if I were going to be fanciful and go pre-geriatric hippie, I would say the cold streets that we roam all have exactly the same thing written on their street signs. Ignorance. So... We admire those who adapt and overcome in the stories that we read and the movies that we watch. But maybe uh, what's on the screen and what's happening in our lives have somehow merged. Which means we're going to have to cowboy and cowgirl up and take responsibility for ourselves and for our communities. And the first step is fear nothing. The second step is educate yourselves. Educate ourselves and educate each other. And that's what we're doing tonight, the Fukushima Forum. Renamed from Cluster Fukushima because that's pretty much, well, there it is. This is the one and only Coast to Coast AM. In two minutes, we'll be back with Arnie Gunderson. Arnie Gunderson is with us for this hour. And um, I wanted to ask you, is it your opinion that any of this debris making landfall now might not be radioactive. Is there a chance any of this stuff is hot, or is it pretty much washed away on a over a long trip across the Pacific? I'm I'm sure some of it will be will be radioactive. You got to remember that the, the tsunami knocked out over a hundred miles of coast, and um, the tsunami happened before the meltdown. So a lot of that rubble was heading out to sea um, before the um, before the plants exploded. But, but the material that was close to Fukushima, within you know, 10, or, 10 or so miles from Fukushima, maybe even 20, um, um, will be, uh, got contaminated. And, of course, it had a long bath as it worked its way across the, the Pacific. We had an aircraft carrier 100 miles offshore, and, and uh, they were, it actually contaminated the deck of uh, the Ronald Reagan um, 100 miles offshore. So... Clearly, the material got in the ocean. The question is, you know, if uh, um, almost a year over a year at sea, it, it's, it's washed off or not. It, it started out contaminated, and I'm sure we'll find some in the nooks and crannies of the, of the material when it, hits the, uh, when it hits the West Coast. You know, this is just, uh, I mean, I, I expect to, if, you, if you deign to answer this question, it, it will be purely conjecture. But just a couple of guys talking here with 
few million of our closest friends. <laughs> Does that seem like a, a naturally induced tsunami? Because there's a, you know, if there's, there's if there's one thing I can't stand, it's like it was the Zionists did it. They let off a nuke in the ocean. It's like I, you know, I don't know if they did or not. I really don't, but. Um, it does seem like a, an earthquake that size would have caused more structural damage to the um, various man-made structures. So <clears throat> have you given any thought to what actually caused that thing? Does anything about this look funny to you or not really? Is it just a natural disaster and there was a reactor in the way? Well, I, 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 um, I know a bunch of geologists. And you know, the, the, nine, the, the Richter 9 Plus was out at sea. Um, by the time it got to the plant, it was about a 7.5 in the plant was designed for a 7.5. So um, that, it, that, that the earthquake didn't cause uh, these plants to turn into absolute rubble is, uh, is uh, um, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, you know, the, 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 real, the, the real problem is uh, I, I don't need a conspiracy to leave my head shaking because we did this to ourselves. The, there is plenty of evidence on the record that... Uh, over the last 2,000 years, there's been four of these uh, tsunamis of this size that have nailed that part of Japan. Um, um, we, as a civilization on the planet, you know, the American engineers who built this plant, um, had ample geologic um, data to indicate that, hey, every five, 600 years, a, a tsunami of this size hits, and we didn't design against it. Um, so I, I don't need a... Uh, a conspiracy to uh, um, you know to get angry at mankind for, uh, for for watching dollars as opposed to watching safety, and I think that's really what happened uh, at, at Fukushima. Uh, let me ask you something. Somebody wanted to ask: Are, are you are you uh, now? Are you still active in the uh, in the in the design phase of, of any of the new reactors, or, or have you shifted out of that? Um, I'm active on uh, one reactor design, the AP-1000, which is the one that's going to be built down in uh, um, South Carolina. But, uh, uh, that, but mainly, is... I've been uh, uh, um, I've been paying attention to the the old reactors. So we got a hundred old reactors in this country that, uh, um, well, like me, are, are should be nearing retirement. And now, is this new one that you're you're working on? Is it the uh, the fourth uh, generation reactor? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's called AP for Advanced Passive, and it's built by um, Westinghouse, a U.S. firm, and Toshiba, um, a Japanese firm. Um, it's interesting because the people knew that that a loss of offsite power was the most likely cause of an accident, which is what happened at Fukushima, and the, the this plant was built to withstand that, but. You know, engineers make trade-offs. So to, pre- to, to pre- make a plant that doesn't need electricity, they made a plant that's seismically much weaker than the plants we've got in, in Japan. So uh, Westinghouse Toshiba will be out there saying that this new design could have withstood the, uh, uh, the tsunami. And, and they're right. But the problem is it wouldn't have withstood the, the earthquake. Um, so, uh, in the trade-offs that go into building plants, uh, you pick up some benefit, but you lose some uh, some robustness as well. Worst case scenario, of course, would be if uh, reactor number four gets hit with another one. And it's um, if you look on a little earthquake map, you'll see that there are little rumbles just occurring all the time over there. It's all the time. Um, China syndrome. What is China syndrome? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I'd like to talk about that worst case scenario. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Take them in order. Yeah, we we've had two close calls already on, on the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Um, you recall that the, the the Americans withdrew out beyond 50 miles at the beginning of the accident because they were worried about the uh, uh, Unit Four fuel pool. Uh, but in addition, when the tsunami hit the coast of Japan. It knocked out the diesel generators, not just at Fukushima Daiichi, but at 14 other nuclear plants up and down the coast. So those 14 plants had uh, 37 diesels, 24 of which were knocked out. So we almost had a, a situation where we had 15 meltdowns and not and not three. Um, you know, some very heroic Japanese men uh, 
risk their lives to, to prevent that. So you know, this, now we're talking about Unit 4 again because structurally it's weak and it has an enormous amount of radioactive material in it. And, uh, you know, another, um, you know, Richter 7 or more earthquake will, will likely either crack that fuel pool or, uh, or topple the building. Uh, in which case, the, the fuel is hot enough still um, to burn in air. Um, uh, it, it can ignite the, the, the metal that the, that the nuclear fuel is made from um, uh, can ignite. Now, Brookhaven National Labs uh, has done a study that shows that uh, a fuel pool that's a lot less full than Fukushima um, uh, in the case of a fuel pool fire would cause 186,000 fatalities. So we're looking at a, uh, you know, the possibility God help us if we have another earthquake. But you know, like you said, there it's Japan and it's happening all the time. If they have a Richter seven or, or greater, um, it's likely that we'll get uh, either a damaged pool or, or a collapsed building. But the Tokyo Electric has acknowledged that the building is has a bulge in the side of it as a result of uh, the, you know the previous tsunami and earthquake. So it's a weakened building, and uh, um, we're, we're in a race against time. We either empty that fuel pool as quickly as we possibly can, get it down on the ground as, as in dry casks um, uh, before the, the next earthquake comes. And back, up, back to that China syndrome thing, is this where the material burns down to the groundwater? Yeah, the, the China syndrome uh, happens from the chain reaction has stopped. The nuclear chain reaction stops almost immediately when the nuclear fuel rods come in. But there's all that decay heat from these daughter products. Um, if you don't get a China syndrome in the first month, you're not going to get one. So the plant has been cooled long enough that there's still a lot of heat, but not enough to melt into bedrock. Okay, uh, good. Yeah, well, the, the good news is it won't go down. The bad news is it'll go up as, as uh, you know, as, as flame and, and smoke. So, uh, but it, uh, but the concept of a melting uh, a molten blob melting into bedrock uh, is behind us. Uh, they were in, they, and, and we all knew that in, in the industry. They were in a race against time, and um, um, they, they, you know, they were risking workers and, and pouring salt water on the nuclear reactor. When really, that's not a good thing to do. But the alternative would be to get that China syndrome that you were just talking about. And that would have been worse than, than salt water or, or worker exposures or anything. So uh, they made the right uh, the right choice. Now you mentioned that our our reactors are thirty something years old, maybe even a little older. What, um, what what sort of a position are we in? We have earthquakes here sometimes. I understand uh, sometimes. I understand some of these reactors are sitting near fault lines across the country. Only takes a couple of them to get cracked, and there's a problem. So, uh, is there? Are you aware of any plan to revamp or recondition these plants, or are we just going to like see how it works out? There's uh, 27 nuclear reactors that are um, that the NRC has known for over 10 years um, are um, are in jeopardy from earthquake issues, and and they're not on the west coast; they're on the east coast. Uh, we underdesigned our nuclear plants on the east coast because we really didn't understand. Uh, seismic issues back in the 60s when these plants were being built. Um, the worst plant in the in the country, as far as uh, seismic uh, risk, I guess, is Indian Point, which is um, only 25 miles outside of New York. Um, it was it was underdesigned, and, and again, as we're going on and learning more about, oh my God, there's a fault just a couple miles north of the plant that they didn't know about when they built it. But anyway, there's 27 East Coast plants that uh, are reevaluating their seismic design. Um, and what that means is that they'll put extra shock absorbers, just like in your car, but huge, um, in the plant to try to uh, prevent these pipes from swaying too much. But what will happen, though, is that to revamp a plant uh, is very expensive. And these plants are quite old. You know? So uh, my guess is that when, when it gets to the point where the NRC says fix it, um, a lot of these uh, plants will say it's, it's cheaper to shut them down than it is to um, than it is to make these necessary repairs. Well, two qu two part question. 
Number one, or Roman numeral one, because there aren't any additional letters under it, is nuclear energy a good idea? And second, what, in, in your opinion, is the future of nuclear energy in this country? You know, my, my career was, I guess, has 40 years, and, and I, I started out um, uh, you know, with uh, high hopes for nuclear and uh, actually believed the system worked. In 1990, I became a nuclear whistleblower, and uh, I no longer trusted the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but I still believed in nuclear power. And um, even like a month before Fukushima, I was out there saying to people, we should, uh, we should never build coal or, or oil because of global warming. We should focus on renewables. And, and like your next guest on, on, on alcohol and renewable fuels, we can, we can do it other ways. But if that's not enough, we should still build nuclear. But what Fukushima t- taught me uh, is that we as a, as a species are not smart enough to defend against what Mother Nature can throw at us. Um, or what terrorists can throw at us. It, it, you know, that, that might be the, the, the next accident. It might not be Mother Nature. It might be terrorists. So um, my conclusion, my personal conclusion, is uh, very similar to Mikolai Gorbachev in his, uh, uh, in his memoir say that, says that it wasn't perestroika that destroyed the Soviet Union. It was Chernobyl. So we're dealing with a technology that can destroy a nation. Is it really worth the risk? Um, the second half of your question about uh, nuclear looking forward, uh, we wouldn't have nuclear. There's four new nuclear plants being built in the South. Um, they would not be built if the economics were uh, being considered. Wall Street won't touch them, but we've got enormous federal loan guarantees. So all of us nationwide are ponying up loan guarantees to get these plants built because, in fact, they don't make any economic sense. Oh, yeah, so somebody uh, clever in the uh, political arena will say, well, it was taxpayer money with that look on their face like we, the people, approved this. It's, uh, it's extraordinary to me. The, um, I, I testified down in, uh, down in South Carolina on, on, on the two nukes down there, and they said, you know, you're a Yankee. Why don't you just stay home? Uh, you know, this is, this is our plan. <laughs> And I said to him, you know, you're absolutely right. I'll, I'll gladly stay home and not talk about safety, but don't ask for me to guarantee your loan. It works right. both ways. Mm-hmm. Why, in your opinion, is it, has the entire world not come to Japan's aid? Surely there must be some smart guys out there that can figure out what, some sort of cover to put on this thing, something? I think that uh, Tokyo Electric and the Japanese government are... are um, um, reticent to, uh, to, to step up and really ask for help. Um, I've known some experts who've gone over there with great ideas, and, and not just ideas, great techniques that work. And they've been told by, by Tokyo Electric and the Japanese that, uh, you know, you're an American firm, we're not going to give this work to you. We're going we're gonna to figure out a way uh, ourselves. So whether it's national pride or the fact that Tokyo Electric is essentially bankrupt and, and can't afford it, um, um, in, in any event, all those things are conspiring to slow this process down. Uh, you're right. There are a lot of ideas and there are a lot of talented people who would like to step into this void. And um, um, Tokyo Electric and the Japanese government are, are uh, just not willing or capable of, um, of asking, asking for help. i got a feeling it goes back to that ancient uh, face-saving thing. Yes. You know? I think you're right. This is... Uh, um, you know, it shouldn't be um, because these are an American design. <laughs> the the FEMA one, two, three, and four were identical to plants that I worked on here on the on the East Coast, Millstone One, Pilgrim, uh, et cetera. So uh, you really, it, it's not as if the Japanese were marching to a different drummer back in the seventies when these plants were built. But um, I think you're right. Part of it is saving face. Well. I've used this term already once tonight, the pre-geriatric hippie thing, but it's too bad that somebody, some some actual statesman couldn't approach that government and say, look, you know, if you think about it, we're partially responsible for this because we made the demand and you came up with the products. You're a small country and you've put out cars and electronics and all kinds of things and just had a booming economy and then started having problems. And so so now you've got a problem and we're willing to help. We... um you know, we, we enjoyed the, the proceeds uh, from you, the fruits of your labors, 
and now you have trouble. Let us help you. I mean, I don't get it. Uh, I mean, where where is where is the global compassion for a nation? Th- this could result if 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 that if that number four goes down and and we go to a worst case scenario, we could have 125 million refugees. They've actually even talked about evacuating the entire country. So, no, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we had um, uh, the world was more um, um, m- more willing to step forward after Chernobyl, perhaps because it was right in the middle of Europe. Uh, but it seems like the Japanese are are um, are left to do it themselves. The cost of this is going to be something on the order of uh, um, a half a trillion dollars. Um, that and, and of course, Japan is a lot smaller country to carry that. I mean, we seem to have run deficits of that amount every year. But uh, right. on top of the, the Japanese deficit, over the next 20 years, they're going to have to raise their electric rates to pay for this because uh, there's there's nobody stepping up to give them half a trillion dollars. Is the money they saved in oil over right. the 40 years they lost. Oh well, yeah, big time, exponentially. We got to go, Arnie. Thank you so much for being with us. It was a pleasure to have you as a first-time guest. Fairwinds.org, F-A-I-R-E-Winds.org, Fairwinds.org. That's Arnie Gunderson.